it's Jason with Incredibly Useful Exercises Volume 8. I'm not even halfway done. Oh my goodness, 16 of these volumes. Uh, I'm getting everything set up. I uh, would normally have set this up ahead of time. I was actually going to film this a little bit later today, but uh, uh, this little boy right here is being nice and quiet, and so I thought it would be a good moment to seize and run through these. And I told myself I wasn't going to edit these, so let, here's hoping that there are no uh, <laughs> pee accidents or any other weird weirdness, uh, but I'm sure I'll be fine. So just getting everything set up here, you truly see the sausage being made in the Heath household in our microscopic and hilariously expensive San Francisco condo. Why are we living in San Francisco? Oh goodness. Uh, so getting the end pin set, I like to go on notch five, which I like. I've been having problems getting everything to record for some reason, but I know the GoPro is going. I'm going to swap over to Modacity, my practice app of choice, and we'll get a screen grab going on that, get the audio going here so you can hear my bass a little bit better. And the thing that's been causing problems, this stinking iPad capture uh, should hopefully be working. I tested it. So here we go. Um, so incredibly useful exercises volume eight, upper octave fingerboard mastery is what we're doing here today. I'll take my practice mute off so you can see it. There's Mr. William, good boy. And uh, so tune rods and get set is how I start my days every day. Um, I'll have to rethink through this at some point, but basically I just go into my tuning app of choice, which is uh, tonal energy, although you can use anything. And I just give myself a little check and my rosin is being a little bit funky. It's we've dropped like 25 <laughs> degrees here in San Francisco. So it's much more temperate than it was last week. I want to film these. Can't believe it. I've been filming these for two months now. So my E string's a little sharp otherwise. Pretty good. And then my, uh, this is Leatherwood Bespoke Ros, and I've got this linked up to, I've got Modacity linked up to, anything I'm using that's special. Obviously the incredibly useful exercises linked up to also. Um, and so Leatherwood Bespoke Ros, and this is the 30% hydration, which is good heat wave rosin for me, but now it's a little colder, so it's feeling a little bit, uh, well, we'll see. I don't wanna judge it too soon. Uh, I might need to go back to 40% or even 50% if the cold weather holds, which would be awesome, actually. Now we're getting some good bite. That's what I'm looking for. Just a little bit of grab, and then I can release. We're getting just a little bit of powdering on the strings, not too bad. So we're gonna get into this before we do. Uh, this has not been taking me that long. Um, I could spend more time on this, but I know that we're going to be combining all of these soon. So uh, I'm just sort of enjoying the slight break in uh, intensity might be the word uh, that, that, that I'm finding with these. Okay, let's just make sure I'm getting a good angle here before I get going. So. I don't, okay, good. Hopefully that is good enough for y'all. Okay, um, so silence. Great. Beginning and ending your practice session with silence is great. Oftentimes I use the Apple Watch and I use the Breathe app, but I haven't been doing that since Dennis has this built into the uh, routine, which is pretty cool. Okay. Uh, so again, this is upper octave fingerboard mastery. Um, we, we're going to start with centering and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into thoughts on the exercises. This is just what I would do in a practice session, just probably not as much <laughs> talking. So if you've watched these or Dennis, if he's put this out just quickly, how this goes, we're just going through the body parts, feet all the way through the extremities. So feet, knees, hips. Then I bring my attention to my breath. Same thing, lower back. Shoulder blades, just kind of uh, checking with the back, neck, 
face against uh, bring your attention to your breath throughout. Uh, then you go up the right arm or through the right arm from the larger to smaller body parts. Uh, and then the same thing with the left arm, uh, body, arms, breathe. All that over a scale. Dennis wrote a G major scale. You can do whatever, but I'll do G major. So start, I focus on my feet. Just kind of bring my attention there. I'm gonna take as many boats as I need. The point is not the notes. Maybe take another bow, thinking about my knees, assessing where I'm at in terms of activation. You know how uh, loose or tight, tight maybe is not the word to think of, but how am I feeling? Hips, I'm feeling that connection all the way down through the knees and the feet, then focus on my breath. Think about lengthening, lower back, ooh. I have been holding some tension. Wow. I am I'm already feeling more uh, kind of loosey-goosey. Shoulder blades. I let myself just, you know, change my stance a little bit. I'm not really, oops, boxes in the way. I'm not really trying to sway, just, but if it happens, that's cool. Bring my attention to my breath. Neck. Face. breath, right shoulder, right elbow. By the way, I try to breathe in through the nose, right wrist, exhale through the mouth. Now I'm going down my left arm, left shoulder, elbow, wrist, kind of tying it all back to the other body parts. Oh, maybe I want to sit on that one. Maybe feeling a little bit of something. Left fingers, I can always move them if I want to make sure everything's cool. Bring it back to the breath. Body, lengthen, arms, and close it out with the breath. Okay, that's great. Love that exercise. I think Dennis actually just filmed this one and uh, did a really, yeah, he did. Um, so check out his channel. It's linked, every one of these videos has his channel linked up too. Uh, and over time, these videos are all uh, appearing uh, on that channel. So you'll have one for each one of these exercises. So now we're getting into the upper octave, three note progressive scale, which we've done in the lower octave. And I think we've even combined the whole thing, if I remember, maybe, maybe not. Um, but so the idea with this, this is one that I picked up also from Jeff Bradetage. I worked with Jeff Bradetage, who's the bass professor at University of North Texas, has a great bass studio. I studied with him at Northwestern University for a bit in the summer. Um, uh, this is a very cool exercise. This one I actually find a little more challenging than the four note. Um, so if you've watched these before, I, I, you, you've heard me go through how these work, uh, but you have, you have three notes, which is going to be an odd grouping here. So if we had, uh, you'll see in the four notes, it's you can put two notes in the position, two notes in the position. With the three notes, we have, uh, we, we have, well, what we could do is we could do this. Where I'm doing thumb one and something, you know, or thumb two and three or what have you, depending on the intervallic configuration. But I think that the challenge here is one that that is real. It's useful to have as a skill set uh, that you can just do. So what we're doing is we're shifting up on our lower numbered finger. Ooh, intonation. Back on our on our upper numbered finger, which I know gets really wordy, but we go one one three. Three, three, one. Then we start the new pattern with the finger that's already down from the old pattern. Um, just because we, we, we could go. We could go directly to one, but that's less efficient actually than. And so on and so forth. I just realized I left my bass rag over here and. Uh, the humidity in here is getting ugh, gross. I should wash this base rack. Maybe I'll do that today. Um, the one of the things that I like to have with me at any time of year, but especially in the summer, kind of 
aid in aid in my shifting. So there we go. Okay, so that's how this works. I use a drone oftentimes, and I set the drone on the fifth. So we're in A major here, so I just set an E. And I usually set in the third octave in Modacity, or the fourth, depending. Uh, fourth would sound like this. Maybe we'll try fourth today. So we're just gonna go through these, uh, starting with this one. Now next bar, we got this. So on and so forth, three. And now right here, I'll turn this drone off for a second, right here. Um, Dennis is putting three in parentheses or two right there. And I, I, this is something that I really didn't uh, start to do until more recently in my playing, which is this D harmonic right here, I think of. So it's the same as this D harmonic. There's the G, there's the D. I think of this as the point where I stop really using third finger except for special cases. And the reason why, which is beautifully described by David Allen Moore in his fractal fingering course for Discover Double Bass. I will try to remember to link up to that up, up or down. <laughs> um, is your hand, when as you go this direction, your hand, the fingers start to point this way, just naturally, you know, like just as this, this would probably work better without a GoPro. So maybe I'll have to film a more proper video at some point on this, but, but as you go this direction, the fingers, and you can kind of see this, you start to it, like, there's a reason why we don't use fourth finger up in thumb positions. It's just the natural motion of the arm kind of makes these fingers too far away for practical use. Third finger is great right here. As soon as you get up here, it gets a little squished if you use third finger. And I didn't even really uh, start to think about that or understand that until uh, recently. And, and I've now been doing two when I get above the D harmonic, which I really find. So like. Because at that point, one, and two are awesome for a whole step. It's not a big deal at all. So I, up up high, generally am doing just thumb one and two. And that get, lets me do whole steps, it lets me do half steps or various configurations. Um, so the idea with this exercise is that it, then it continues like you saw me do. And we're going to actually go slightly above that high A. So we're going to go to this high B and then stop on the A and turn it around. So let me just actually, let me just play it. Uh, and then I'll show you if you're new to this area, maybe how you could think about practicing this. So we start on A, let me turn that drone back on. Start on A. Whoops, I totally lost my center pitch there. So I'll start again. There's the A, and then I would turn it around and go back down. Um, I was practicing that too fast, which is my my uh, <laughs> my bad habit, especially after my morning coffee, where I'm at right now. Um, so I am a fan of the drone just for keeping me honest. If I was new to this, I would I would put the drone on and I would take this first bar and I would just hang out on this motion. So. And as I've said many times in this series, trust but verify. So that helps you to verify. Also, you can check that A against the D harmonic. You can check against the open A or that harmonic, which might not be so useful because that's very wolfy on a lot of people's bases. Then that B, there's a harmonic. It's a little flat, but it's there. And then C sharp. There's a C sharp again, a little flat, but it's there. Probably close enough for, for uh, early, early practice purposes. So getting that. Mm -hmm. 
just getting that motion, I would just do that on these if you're new to this. And then maybe day two or even week two, add in the next piece. Just think small with this sort of stuff and you'll achieve uh, much, much more over time. One more thing, I really like to imagine as if I had a fretboard and that each finger was on a specific fret. So I would be here on the 14th fret. That's the octave. So the two dots, just think about that. And then as I go, as I do this first shift right here, the thumb is on G natural, though that's not in the key, that is the spacing I have. It trails my first finger and it's now over A. So. For what I call technical playing, which I think this would fall into, which is, you know, playing uh, relatively quickly moving notes, I want every finger to be on or hovering over a specific note. So again, if you think about that fretboard analogy, um, each finger is going to be on a specific fret. It's not going to be like splayed or anything like that. That will help you develop speed over time. Um, drones are awesome for this. You can notice that I was doing separate bows. I think that's a good move. Also, you might uh, even repeat notes. That gives your right arm something to do while you can move a little bit slower with the left arm. And doing something rhythmic tends to, in my experience, it tends to kind of cement clean shifting a little bit faster. So I could do more on that and I would do more on that if I wasn't yakking, which again, I don't talk to myself unless I'm <laughs> doing one of these videos typically and practicing. Um, Last thing on this is, yes, it's written in A major, but you could do it in any key. We could move it down to G major. <laughs> I can't play G major, apparently. And so on and so forth. Uh, generally, when I'm not recording 16 straight weeks of new, st new stuff like this, I pick a key for the week and I do every relevant exercise in that key. So if my key was G, I would do these in G. I would do the next thing you're going to see in G and that sort of thing. Jason Heath, you got to learn to turn on Do Not Disturb. Okay. Oh, that was just a Walmart. Instacart ad. Okay, going on. Don't get distracted, Jason. Uh, that was okay. Four note progressive, same idea, except now we are doing what's called a tetrachord, which just means four notes. That's that's all it is. Um, these, so just what, what I uh, spoke about in the three note ones, you know, a lot of similarities. The big difference is that they're four, so they divide really evenly. You just put two notes in a position and two notes in a position. <laughs> I probably should have mentioned at the outset, when I'm playing in the upper octave, I am imagining this almost as a different instrument than this instrument down here. So this is like another bass. It's a mini bass that I approach differently. And that includes the way I approach it with the bow. And again, this might require a more proper video with a better camera angle for the bow, but I'll do my best. When I'm up here, I am, I, there is a fairly significant tilt to my bow hair. I don't know how well you can see this, but most of my bow hair is on the string, but really the, the weight is coming in on this side right here, this side closer to me. When I'm down here and playing like an open string, I am pretty much flat hair. And so that changes as I go up high. If I try to use all my bow hair up here, and maybe I'm just not good enough bass player to not have this happen, but I get this very kind of what I would call a pressed sound. Um, and I believe it's because I have too much material on the string. Um, so uh, it, feel free to comment if you want to elaborate on that. And maybe I'll do a video a little more thoroughly on that. But what I'm trying to say <laughs> kind of not very well is tilt. I like to tilt my bow hair. I like to, th I want to make sure I'm definitely close enough to the bridge. Then I'm getting this sort of like clear sound. That's a sound I know quite well. And if you're new to this, you might be getting that. It's this sort of like hollow sound. 
there's a point where it just like opens up and you get what Suzuki calls, or I believe I'm, I'm getting this right, diamond tone. We'll just pretend that I'm getting that right. Um, but just this sound that has a has the brilliance, it has the body. That's what we're looking for right here. And I would do, you know, uh, Dennis has you do two slurred and then do four slurred. And that's awesome. You could even break it down beyond that. You could do one per bow. You could go like... actually find these a little less confusing, even though there are more notes than the three notes. So I usually, when I'm working with people new to these, I generally start with the four notes. Again, a drone could do any octave. Whoops, probably not that octave. That one's okay. And so now we can repeat them as many times as we need to. And now unlike the three note ones, we move directly to one. And notice I'm on two for the E. Oh, you could absolutely do three, that's completely fine. And then just one more thing with these uh, th that I see people getting confused with is like why two, three and not one, two for this half step right here. Uh, Generally, what I tell people is you want the lowest numbered finger on the low note and the highest numbered finger on the high note for any of these four note progressive scales because that's the least amount of distance. Like if I was down in the lower octave, I would do two, four. I wouldn't do one, two, unless I was gonna continue going up or something. The reason being that if I do two, four, I only have to move my hand to here. If I do one, two, I have to move it further. And that's the same exact rationale with why two, three is good. So I will, uh, please stay recording. Are you still recording? Yes, good, okay. Victory. Okay, so I'm gonna play now and try to not talk so much. So there's our drone and we will go. If I hit a sour note, I'm gonna just keep repeating the figure until I'm happy. I can speed up or slow down. There's no temple police coming to tell me what to do. This whole tone. Is usually the most challenging then And again, I'm gonna do one, two up here. I could do two, three, but because of what I was talking about, I find that a little bit harder to play in tune. And now just to show you, my bow is dang close to that bridge by the time I get up there. Do not, well, you do you, do whatever you want. But my, my general advice to, to those who I'm not sure who's watching this video is don't feel like you need to be a hero and get up to that high C sharp anytime soon. Again, I, see, I, I have seen many people just sort of jack up their playing and cause all sorts of bad habits to try to like hit some sort of metric they're trying to do in their playing where where they might have had much better results and much less frustrated and ultimately make much more progress if they just hung out with something simple like these first two ones maybe make just the first two your goal or maybe a good goal is just to get to this high a you know after a few weeks or even months and then stop there um, again repeating each note is a super good idea <laughs> okay to slow it down and I'm always thinking about tone I'm always thinking about getting the the that diamond sound really listening for the tone recording yourself on these uh, well recording yourself in general is great uh, it can be on your phone it could be on something a little bit uh, fancier or whatever um, but just recording and listening back and listening back for 
tone and pitch and just just uh, tempo i could I, I i that's like my last priority whenever i'm working with someone on exercises like this so you go up and go down and then you do the same thing slurring four so then that would be <laughs> And then in my own personal practice and uh, when I'm not uh, running through just trying to demo up a series like I'm doing right here, I will do a wide variety of variations on this, both for the lower octave or the upper octave or connecting the whole thing. One variation would be that I picked up actually from Jeff Bradisage in one of his uh, uh, camps a long time ago is a start piano and get to forte. I wasn't happy with my intonations. So I slowed it down, but anyway, um, doing, do a cre starting piano and crescendo, making a crescendo on the down bow and to a forte and then forte on the up bow back to piano. That's one of the best things you can practice just in general, in my experience, because it kind of evens out the tendency of the bow to decrescendo on the down bow and crescendo on the up bow. You practice the opposite, that's great. You can then do all sorts of different rhythms. Sorry, <laughs> wow, intonation. Or, or you could just go up. You get the idea with that. So great exercises. Um, separate bows is totally cool on these. So uh, whatever you need to do, yeah, three stars. Let's get let's let's be a little more honest. Let's give our uh, let's really be honest. Let's give ourselves two stars. Okay, or maybe one star even. Okay, so now this section is super cool. Um, it, it this. I would dive in, even maybe if you, again, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, assuming that a lot of people are watching this are just like, either uh, they're, they're more on the beginner side, uh, and or maybe you're just zoned out and you're just sort of like uh, browsing YouTube. So w regardless where you come from, let's just assume that you're new to some of these things that I'm talking about. Um, these tunes are so good for developing all kinds of things, which Dennis outlines here as he does with every exercise, but just trying to be musical up here, learning how to be musical up here, learning how to phrase, and just trying to make these sound as good as possible. I think that these are so useful. So they, they in, in order to sound good on these, and these are just, you know, common th tunes, you know, nursery rhymes and and just children's songs and this sort of thing. Um, everything's going to be thumb one, two, and three. Uh, generally, thumb one and two. I don't even know if there are any threes in here, but uh, you will encounter threes in this position. But the octave, or we'll say the root, it's always going to be thumb. One's going to be the third. And that's going to be the fifth, and then anything above that's going to be three. By the way, I don't know if I've talked about this. I'm sure I have, but I have this extended fingerboard. You can actually see. I don't know if you can see that, but you can see the seam. I did not have that put on, though I do like that it's there, I guess. It kind of gets covered in rosin in normal playing, but it can be very weird uh, if you're looking. You might think, like, where the heck is this guy? So I have, uh, it goes up to like a high B. So it might just be visually a little weird um, if, you're wa if you're trying to figure out where I am on the bass. So I'm just starting right here. We're gonna do a little uh, twinkle and we just go through this and we go thumb, two, one, two. And notice I leave down what, I, what I'm coming back to. So see, I'm coming back to A. So I'm gonna leave two down. And then we go on with that and go um. And that that E right there, that's generally the trickiest note to find. So A string, second finger. You're going to have you're going to probably need to feel like you're extending a little sharper than you're expecting. Okay, so I'll play through this. You can check it out. Have 
fun. Make some dynamic shapes. And really try to get that singing sound. And again, Dennis always writes center in these, so you just kind of bring the attention back to the center, which is very cool. Let's do a few more. This is B, lightly row. Now, maybe some dynamic contrast. We'll make a crescendo. make them as musical as you can. So the whole idea, I won't play through all of them right here, that you get the idea with these. Um, you use these a lot in uh, bass, bass music. We'll just say ba bass concertos, bass ensemble pieces, very useful. Actually, David Hayes has a wonderful set of bass quartets. I believe they're all quartets using just harmonics. And of course, I'm blanking on the name. I'll have to try to dig that up, maybe do a review of that. But it's such great material for students for like their first recital because you get so many uh, early recitals and it's people all playing like and the melody's like and it's just like this like uh, sonic rumbling that nobody can really hear the pitches. And, and it's so refreshing. I'm, I'm imagining this is why David did this, but it's so refreshing to hear four young bassists or beginning bassists come out and play something that has like more registral change. So, you know, if you're playing melodies up here, the harmony could be. Then the third part, the fourth part, Something like that. And it just allows for so much more differentiation in the voices than everybody like rumbling in first position. So anyway, my two cents moving on. Uh, those are really useful. I don't, I hopefully it comes through on this, but I'm not sure. Um, Clark thumb drills are great. Again, I picked these up from Jeff Bradditch, uh, and they are, they are, uh, well-known trumpet exercise. This is what trumpet players you hear all the time. If you go to music school, the asterisks refer to, they, they mean leave the finger down actually very similar to the harmonic tunes. Like I was leaving uh, two down right here, same concept for the Clark thumb drills. So here you can look at this first bar I'm going to play. <laughs> I'm going to leave one down because I need to come back to it. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we have so many other challenges. Having to reestablish a note that you've found uh, is probably not one that you want to dig into. I find that I play A, we've got three variants. One starting on thumb, which I just started right now. One starting on one, and one starting on two. I don't know why, but I find that I play A the most in tune and B the least and C the least in tune. So I try to, again, keep myself honest and put on a drone. I like to draw on the fifth. So there's the A droning. So I'll play through these and we're going to start. Leave one down. Now we leave three down. One goes down. Three goes down, and we leave it. And what I generally do is I play through these like three or four times, slowly increasing the tempo. B again, and let's, I would probably do that a couple more times in a regular practice session now. Confident, but verify, repeat the motion, take a little break if you need to, especially for these things where you're more over the bass like this. I think it's always good to bring it back to your center, which I forgot to do. And Dennis actually marked, um, just to sort of reestablish, uh, I find these, especially on this seven eighths this big old bass I'm playing a little bit more physically taxing. 
Also that right there getting the thumb down can be a little bit challenging. Apparently he likes the bass, or at least doesn't mind it. I'm talking about Mr. Sleeper over there. Let me do that without talking. <laughs> And so I have to make a decision. Do I want to bail because everything's out of tune? That time I said yes. But sometimes I might say no and kind of just try to fix it on the fly as I go. There we go. That's better. And then with Modacity, what I would do oftentimes is record myself. So let me just record that. It sounds a little gruesome to listen to as you do that, but I do find it useful to record and play back with the drone, maybe recording on a different device, because sometimes I'm, what's bothering me is not uh, the main issue, which is why recording is so useful. So uh, just real quickly, C then, uh, we, we start the pattern with two, and the challenge is inherent in that. That, uh, that interval combination right there can be a little bit little bit trickier it's just a little bit more of a an open position and with the second finger like like this I find that just to be I need to just and now this this position right here whole step half step whole step that's just not a position I don't really do this in life a lot so that just re, re uh, So I need to work the coordination. Yeah, I need to work this last little bit right here. Um, it's just not really, um, it's not really feeling automatic right now. So the next time I'm, I'm going to move on for today, just so this video isn't a, a million hours long. But um, I, next time, next day that I practice this, I'm going to revisit that and just see if I can get that a little more automatic, a little bit more consistent. Okay, that was okay, sure. Uh, this is the last exercise in this. These are thumb position, hand shapers, really good stuff. Um, again, verifying that you're on track intonationally, I think is really uh, important. Um, so uh, yeah, I like this. These are easier to play than they look on the page. They are. Um, do, do, uh, again, if you are new to this, maybe just these first two bars would be a good spot to start just to kind of get like you're dipping your toes into the upper position waters, but you're not diving into the deep end. I don't know if that analogy worked, but <laughs> we'll go with it. So just that right there, all half steps, chromatic position, then semi-chromatic, one whole step, and then these three fingers are configured half step wise. So. Then what happens is thumb, whoops, I'm going ahead too far. Thumb scooches in and just joins. So now we're back in a chromatic position. So it's kind of like this little inchworm going up the base. So we start everything together. I'll get it out here. Um, geez, Jason, you gotta. Uh, okay. And that's how you go up the bass. Now, I don't know how in tune I was on that, so I need to make sure that I uh, have some spots that I check. Sorry, my brain. Uh, let me do that again. I, lo I lost my. Uh, oh dear. Now this is G A B. 
G sharp A B. And this should be A flat, B flat, C. Now we move up and B A B flat C. Now we're doing A B C sharp. We can check C sharp there. We can check B there. We can check A there. That's a fairly easy one to check. So now we're on B flat, C, D. Move up to B, C, D. And now we're on B, C sharp, D sharp. So B, C sharp. D sharp is tough to check, but you can check those first two. And notice how I've switched to two for my top note because I have gone beyond the D, uh, my D uh, third finger barrier. Now I generally do second finger up here. And that's the idea with that one. I don't know why I went so fast. The extra cup of coffee, don't go that fast. <laughs> I was just happy to get through it. Not that I don't like these, they are very good. And then you do the exact same thing, flip it around. So you start with the uh, semi-chromatic. And I'm just thinking about this whole step, opening and closing. If you remember the bumblebees, if you've been watching through all of these, thank you, by the way, that's a lot of uh, following Jason on his, uh, through his practice sessions with the GoPro. Um, there are some similarities to this and, and bumblebees and several others in here. These are, there are a lot of similarities to many of these exercises, accomplishing similar things, but in slightly different ways. I think I ran out of time when I was doing this a few weeks back, but this one right here is, um, the same idea, just a different hand shape. I do find this one a little more taxing, and it does start down here. So chromatic, then we open it up. If you can get comfortable in this position right here, which I do believe is a lot more comfortable sitting, well, that, maybe I should take that back. Um, no, I, I do. I find it a little more comfortable sitting. So you you probably can. It can be quite comfortable standing too. It's fine standing, but just um. I find that this this motion. This is a really good motion to practice. This sort of um, you know, it's not just all going one direction. Um. is uh, that can take some time to develop to really get that um, so that these are clean. I hear a lot of the time when people are doing similar things to this that you're sort of accidentally hitting the second finger here and there. So you just take time, take your time working on this. Single notes are fine. Repeated notes are fine. Over threes. Or two, then four. And again, you might want to just chill out on that first bar until you get down, uh, get this comfortable. But it's then it follows the exact same thing uh, as the previous uh, hand shaper: chromatic, semi, scooch up the thumb, chromatic, semi, so on and so forth, rinse and repeat. So I might not do the whole thing, but I'll do some of it. Whoops! Let me try that one more time. <laughs> that this um, exercise helps and the other one too with you knowing exactly what fingers on what note at all times or hovering over what note at all times so all of these exercises I do find to be really good for just getting your notes on the grid intonation wise right so if you were you know what I mean so um yeah just just really challenging yourself to really know what note you're on. I think it's super helpful. You can even go real slow and just say the notes like D, 
D, F, E flat. D, F sharp, E. And uh, it, it, there, it can be, it, it will really mess with your brain if you're trying to say the note that you're not on. I find that to be a really good accountability uh, exercise for this. Drones are a little bit harder with this because you're moving chromatically up and down the bass. Um, but yeah, these are really good. The same exact thing happens. You finally get to this D. And then you just flip it around. And you can do multi, you can do four per one if you want. Or you can do two. And that sort of thing. They're really, really wonderful exercise. Um, I don't know why I'm playing some, them so fast. I, I almost never do that unless I'm like really trying to work something specifically for a piece. But apparently that's my jam here uh, in, in the morning. So uh, hopefully these were useful. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm digging these exercises and we'll do a little bit of silence here at the end before we wrap up. So that without the talking is probably one of the shorter ones that I've been doing. I think that's been taking me about, um, oh, about 30 minutes, something like that. So hopefully you're enjoying these. That is halfway through these exercises. Oh my goodness. So we've got volume nine coming next, nine through 16. And we start to combine some more of these. They become a little bit more, uh, there's just a little more volume in terms of what you're asked to do in some of these later ones, if I remember right. So for some of these ones that are a little bit lighter, you could take these exercises and approach them like I was doing, take a little bit more time with them, maybe really build them up. And that's what we're gonna do. William, you wanna go for a walk? Do you wanna go for a walk, boy? No? Oh, okay, well, he might. We'll see. We'll see you later.